totalitarianism. That we respect everybody, we put everybody equally before the law and equally before our system. Democracy is actually a very vibrant and transparent system, an equitable system that allow people to vote for the best leaders according to their aspiration. And it is accountable because they can still control the quality of the leadership of the people. They can vote for the leader, but at the same time they can also can vote against the leader because of this very transparent system. And democracy, of course, gives opportunity for every single citizen. And it is, it is very possible and very healthy for our social system that open what we call as a meritocratic system. When the system is open, then democracy allow everybody to achieve the best achievement and to contribute at the best service for the people and for the country. This is actually one of the uh, one of the uh, agenda that for us we no longer question democracy. In in Indonesia, of course, we see as Buyani mentioned, but any also already mentioned that that Muslim in Indonesia are very strong supportive of this democratic system. Of course, we do not negate some of the small number of Muslim organization that strongly against democracy. They want to set up a caliphate system. But when we ask question, who will be the caliph? And where is the position of the, of the capital city of one single caliphate for all people on the earth? They cannot, uh, they cannot answer the question. So one day I had a discussion with one of the, with, with one of the leader of, of his Tahrir. I will ask him, Mas, Mas is one of the very good uh, calling for, for Japanese to respect other people with, with, with love. <laughs> Mas mean cool, ya Pak Nino ya. Mas itu adalah bisa Mas cool. And I said, I will support your organization if you can if you can tell me who will be the caliph. <laughs> and then second, where is the capital city of your caliphate? And then he replied, no, join my organization, I will tell you later. <laughs> and I said, you should tell me, and then I will join later. <laughs> so how can organizations that cannot tell the system offer something for the people? That is why organizations like Muhammadiyah, for example, we already made a very important conclusion in our last Congress that this Indonesia, according to Muhammadiyah, is a country that we call as Darul Ah. Sorry. A country of consensus, because Indonesia become a Pancasila country is actually based on the consensus among the leaders of the country, and we don't want to we don't want to break this kind of consensus because it is such a very brilliant consensus that bring Indonesia together into the country named Indonesia with its plurality and its diversity. The second, we call Indonesia as Darul Shahada. The country where we contribute, when we do our best to make this country as the example for many other countries, especially, of course, with regard to how Muslims contribute to the democratic system and to the democratic culture. So our challenge now is actually how to bring the value of democracy, egalitarian, transparency, openness, tolerance, and pluralism to the ground as part of our social movement but also political movement and how to bring this democratic system as the system that make Indonesia as a prosperous country, as a country where people live peacefully but also live side by side with other people from different parts of the world. This is actually the challenge that, that actually we are still working on and we are very optimistic because I think so many, so many challenges already passed but the challenge ahead also not a simple challenge, especially when we're facing 2018 election and 2019 elections. But again, democracy is not only about election, but democracy is also about the value, about the culture, and it is the value and the culture of democracy that part of our struggle to make Indonesia as a democratic country, a Muslim and a democratic country in the world. Thank you, Madam. Ya, makasih Mas Endi, para tore sormati, uh, honorable participants.
I think even more difficult uh, to me to become that speaker because <laughs> both speakers are public speakers, so they are very well trained in uh, presenting their idea in front of uh, publics. Let me start from little bit an argument that actually beside creating a freedom, space of freedom, democracy also create illiberal attitude and behavior among people. Because democracy provides space for contestation and contestation is free is free for all people. In this regard, for instance, those who didn't agree or disagree with democracy can participate and also can engage in the era of contestation or in the field of contestation. And those who agree with democracy also freely participate in the contestation. But the difference is that those who disagree with democracy will contest the space for demeaning the meaning of democracy. And those who agree with democracy, they use the space to contest for strengthening and deepening democracy. This is that happened actually in our country in the last 10 years, I think. We opened democratic reform since the resignation of Suharto in 1998. And we did what we call political deregulation, which is all believers and all people can have a democratic life, for instance, establishing an organization with using belief and faith as the foundation of organization. On one side, this is very fruitful for democracy. But as I said before, it also creates some kind of possibility to install the different system of democracy. In the era, many Islamic organization were established and they use the principle not only Islamic organization, Christian organization and also they establish an organization which is based on their belief and religion. And because of that they struggle for the goals and intention of religion. Now after some years of being reform uh, state. This problem is still happening until now. I think if we talk about uh, democracy, of course, what has been mentioned by Mbak Yeni and also uh, Mas Mokti is the positive side of democracy in our country. However, we still have some kind of dark side of democracy in uh, our country. I would like to give two prominent examples in this case. First is about religious freedom. We still have many issues and many problems that relate to the religious freedom. It is because as democratic country, Indonesia still believe in the, in the application of blasphemy law in the application of blasphemy law. As case that we can see in the case of Pak Ho, the, the former uh, candidate of uh, Jakarta governor, which was charged by the law of uh, blasphemy. Some people say that what has been mentioned or what has been taught by Pak Ho at the time is not included in the category of doing blasphemy, but it is part of religious freedom. But then, because we still have a problematic legal framework for this kind of issue, then this 
space are used by the opponent of op political opponent of Pao to bring this case into the court. This is our problem, and not only relate to uh, Pao, but we still have the minority Ahmadis and also the minority uh, uh, Shiite in, in in Madura. They until now they are still living in the uh, refugee camp in uh, Surabaya. This is the reality that we already we still have in uh, our country. As long as we still have the blasphemy law or other product which are legal product which are similar to the blasphemy, I think the future of democracy in Indonesia still under the question. The second one is that the increasing authority or non-elected non -elected mesh organization. As you know, that we have a lot of Islamic civil society organization. Islamic civil society organization on one side can contribute to the mushrooming of democracy, but on the other hand, it also can create what I call is illiberal, uh, how to say, not illiberal democracy, illiberal democracy, maybe illiberal democracy, using the term of Farid Zakaria. <coughs> Uh, this Islamic uh, unelected uh, mass organization currently have increasing rule in the society. I would like to give you an example from my own organization that I affiliate that mentioned here, uh, Council of Indonesian Ulama. The Council of Indonesian Ulama, it is and council which was established in 1975 in the era of Suharto and the era, the intention of creating Council of Indonesian Ulama was to provide advice and services to the hukuma, to the government, to the official governments. But because of the change of the time, especially after the reform era, then Council of Indonesian Ulama changed the rule from being the guardian of Hukuma, the government, to become the guardian of Ummah in order to increase their appearance, public appearance, and also public rule in the society. By having new rules, they want to be in the sight of the whole interest, what, we, what they call as Ummah, meaning Ummah is kind of term that refer to the group of religious community. And MUI, in order to conduct its rule, they tend to become some kind of, let's say, following the popular voice and interest of the society, or what we call some kind of Islamic uh, populism. And one of very contributing thing to the illiberal democracy, they about the fatwa that the issue. In 2005, for instance, MUI issue several fatwa one of the very important fatwa, religious ethic, meaning one of the important fatwa that using term pluralism, secularism, and also secularism, liberalism, and pluralism are prohibited. According to MUI, we cannot use this term in the public sphere. This is the fatwa, for instance. And also, there is a fatwa on the prohibition of being Ahmadis, the follower of Ahmadiyya. Ahmadiyya is an Islamic sex. Their number here is very, uh, is many. Maybe 
I do not know exact number, but I think almost two million. And also, uh, they live in the silent area. They don't want to be in public uh, space because there is a fatwa that Muhammadiyah is banned. And the government of Indonesia, the state of Indonesia, follows the fatwa given by MUI by issuing what I call a joint decree between the Ministry of Religious Affairs, the Ministry of uh, Home Affairs, and the Ministry of Attorney, General Attorney, General Attorney, uh, in 2008, that the activities of Madhya should be limited, should be restricted. They, they can practice their belief, but they cannot say their belief in the public uh, space. This is actually reality that we now have because of the increasing authority of mass organization, mostly Islamic organization, and the increasing society, the, the increasing uh, power is not how to say, it's not uh, balanced by uh, the rule of the state. Many, in many occasions, the government and also the state just follow what has been mentioned by an Islamic uh, organization. I think these two challenges are very real and very factual among us. And if we didn't have any effort, serious effort, to eradicate this challenge, maybe we are going to different direction of being uh, good democracy or bright democracy in the future, but maybe we can go somewhere else. Thank you. Thank you, Masanti. We have three very interesting uh, presentations, I think, by Yeni was very optimistic, positive, that's multi, very optimistic. But I think we have more uh, a, a different perspective from Mashabik because he would he could down to the more specific details, the institutions like the MUI, the Blasphemy Law, and the uh, and the, the social organizations. Uh, so uh, maybe I'll, I will I will ask the questions first before I let the floor. <coughs> Okay, uh, Mashatik actually referred to the, the, the elections in, in Jakarta early this year where the incumbent governor lost uh, primarily because the opposition used religion. This is something that you mentioned about religion being used uh, for political ends. And the sad thing is that they, they prevail. Those who use or exploit religion for political ends, they prevail and they won the elections. So, uh, can I ask Bayani, uh, whether is this going to happen again? Uh, is this going to be a trend that people are they, they, they have, they're encouraged that they were successful in exploiting religion for political and they won? And this would send signal to others, okay, this is the way to win elections. And we have still been one, well, more than 100 elections, local election in 2018, and we have the national election in 2019. Uh, people will use any issues that could stir up emotions in, in the society. And um, whether these sentiments, this, this, this is what the so-called uh, popular sentiments, whether this sentiments will be successful or not, it really depends on the socio-economic condition at the time. When the income disparity is high, when the, um, the economic, when there's a, an economic crunch in the society, when people feel uh, uh, hopeless about their future, when uh, they feel fearful, when they feel that, uh, you know, the, that uh, there's an injustice in the society, then they need, there is a need to blame someone or something. And this is something that many politicians are apt to utilize as a platform. 
So instead of competing on programs, instead of competing on um, platforms that, uh, uh, real platforms, you know, about, about their own, uh, what do you call it? Performance. They use popular sentiments. And the popular sentiments, as we see from other countries, not in Indonesia, but other countries, not just Indonesia, I mean, has proven to be quite successful. Australia, uh, Austria is the latest example, how you know, it turned to the right now. Many European countries have turned to the right. People want easy answer to complicated problems. And politicians are ready to give them all these easy answers, even though, uh, looking at history, these easy answers uh, always fail to materialize. You cannot exclude a segment in the society and blame them for all the malaise in the society. And that's, that's the history lesson that we've learned. But it, turns, it, it seems like people don't ever learn. I mean, who would have ever thought that uh, the great democracy of the United States would have elected someone like Donald Trump? Uh, but is that a reflection of America? Of all Americans as a whole? I don't think so. Just because they elected Demo uh, Donald Trump doesn't mean that all Americans, all male Americans are misogynists, for example. So, uh, I think in Indonesia, we will see, we will see more politicians using popular sentiment that can take the form of religious issues as well as, as ethnic issues. So every country has their own um, hidden sensitive issues that's bubbling under the surface, and they come up in certain times, usually uh, near the elections. Europe, racial issues, uh, you know, ethnic issues and religious issues certainly are there. It's always been there. There's a division of class and all that are always there. It's always there. America, the color of the skin always colors the election. In Indonesia, it's about religion and it's also about ethnicity. These are the two uh, issues that have always um, has always been used by many irresponsible people, as mostly our politicians, or people who are just fighting for resources uh, to advance their agenda. So this, uh, in, in my prediction, we will be see, we'll still see many popular sentiments in the form of religious issues and ethnic issues being used for election, especially in the 2019 election. And this is the joke, this is the, the irony, because it doesn't really matter whether what is your religion, but you can still be accused of being anti-Islam, as is the case of President Jokowi. President Jokowi is someone who prays five times a day and plus, who fasts every, you know, uh, every um, fasting month, every Ramadan, plus, you know, he, he also fasts like uh, a few times in a week. But still, he's accused of being a, not only non-Muslim, you know, a communist, uh, communist from a communist background, but also a, an anti-Islam figure. So this is the joke uh, in this country that, uh, you know, uh, you can be anything, but they will still throw mud at you. And the same thing with Donald Trump in the United States. How could some, I mean, Melania Trump was, um, attacked, sorry, not Melania Trump, uh, 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 Obama's wife, um, Michelle Obama was attacked during Obama's time for wearing sleeveless dress by the conservative Christians in the United States. But they would turn their head away from Melania who sprawled naked on the cover of magazine and still voted for Trump. What kind of a hypocrisy is that? But that's the kind of things, I know people put on, put on a certain filter when looking at things. They put things in compartments and they will vote based on these compartments. So the same thing will happen in Indonesia, I think, in my opinion. Um, uh, sorry, before I post the next question, just wanted to announce that this uh, seminar is being broadcast live through the Facebook. Facebook yeah. I hope President Trump doesn't watch this show. <laughs>
and uh, there will be people uh, posing questions. All right, that's good. Well, this is the multimedia university. <laughs> okay. Uh, my, my next question is for Marcus uh, Mulder. You mentioned it's not so much the system, but the individuals, individuals uh, who are taking advantage of what you call corruption, also. But you know, precisely the individuals who are able to to exploit this because the system is weak. Right? So uh, we, we have been reforming, the, we have been carrying out political reforms, but uh, if, if you have to fix the, the system to make it less uh, vulnerable to corruption and abuse, what would that be? Yeah, of course, democracy sometimes calls by the people and for the people. Therefore, the decision is actually at the head of the people. Therefore, in order to to reduce or maybe to eliminate a corrupt leader, then we have to start from the very beginning, that is from the election. We face the reality that we still face problem with the issue of candidacy buying and vote buying, vote buying. when the candidate of governor or maybe city major could buy the candidacy from a political party. Then when they successfully buy the candidacy from a political party, then anyone can actually run if they are very rich. This is our first challenge. The second is food buying. They try to pay and buy the food for the people. Therefore, our agenda to make this democracy is better, first of course to make sure that political party has to be transparent in relation to the candidacy of leadership, including the candidacy of a member of the parliament. 2018 is the year when the political party already appoint the candidate for members of parliament. I notice it might be commencing from April 2018. The nomination or the candidacy of members of parliament already appointed by the political parties. And the election of the 2019 president will be uh, determined on the October 2018. Now we still have time to have what we call as photos education and public education, especially among young intellectuals and middle class intellectuals that they still can play roles to make this democracy better. It is our challenge, of course. It is not always easy, but we can do this thing. Because we can, we can do what we call political advocacy by making certain kind of civil society movement that is very civilized by, for example, evaluating the candidate that are nominated by political parties. Because the name of the candidate has to be published and announced to many media, and multimedia, maybe through this multimedia university. <laughs> Meaning that keep the process open and ask people not to be very passive, but people has to be actively participate in these democratic processes. The second, of course, is the process that we could, let's say, impose the implementation of all regulation. Because some of the problem is the negotiation on the regulation. It is the challenge that is not easy, but it is the possibility that we can do as civil society organization or the one that we can do as the rational and intellectual citizens of Indonesia. The majority of Indonesian voters are actually middle class society. This is the largest group among the voters of Indonesia. 
these are people who are getting more and more rational and they are more actually objective in seeing the future of the country. This country could be better if we have good leader with good leadership. This country could be better if we have strong government with clean government. And again, it is part of our struggle. It is not always easy, but yes, we can. <laughs> that, that sounds familiar. Okay, uh, my last question is to Mas Shafiq. Uh, you mentioned that democracy created this liberal behavior. And one of the things that we are seeing is the behavior of our, the people in social media. This, there are just so many things going on in social media. But for some reason, the the uh, the one that prevails, the one that dominates, are uh, the one that's uh, spreading hate speech, hoax, and that somehow uh, and some of these actually carry reli religious uh, intonations, right? uh, using uh, Islam or other religious uh, religion issues uh, to exploit or to 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 influence people's uh, thinking. Uh, so, is there? Uh, do you think that's going to undermine democracy, uh, this, the use of social media, in particular use of religion issues in social media? I think this is an undeniable thing of being democratic in a democratic country. And I forget to say to you that Indonesia actually embraced democracy Pancasila. This is very specific democracy which is adopted by our founding fathers that believe in one God and many people interpret the meaning of belief on one God is also to give the power of the state to limit the expression of religious freedom. This is one thing. Because we live in democracy, Pancasila, Pancasila democracy, we have many difficulties to face the problem like hate speech and uh, let's say expressing uh, the hate to other religions and etc. This is our difficulty, whether we can manage this thing or not. As democratic state, which is not democracy Pancasila, liberal democracy I mean, we can let them to play the role in the social media. Whatever they say, this is no way to prohibit and to restrict their ideas in the social media, even their idea distract democracy itself. This is that we cannot accept in our Pancasila democracy. And we have debate about this kind of issue. Yesterday, for instance, we have different opinion about the new laws proposed by the President Jokowi about uh, mass organization. According to some group of the society, what we call PERPU, Peraturan Perundangan Penggan Peraturan Pengganti Undang-Undang. PERPU number 2, 2017. We are divided in responding this issue. Muhammadiyah, in the hearing, public hearing with the parliament, yesterday, or uh, two days ago, said that they didn't agree with this proposal and they rejected. And not the ulama agree with this proposal. The reason of Muhammadiyah is that this proposal can demean the meaning of democracy because in this proposal, the state is given a power to disestablish an organization and groups that officially declare anti-Pancasila. And this can be used as a way to demean or diminish the religious freedom too. 
This is our delicate situation. While, on other hands, or other position, on organization like Nahdlatul Ulama, see different way. If we don't have any power to stop distracting organization to our ideology, because ideology is very important to unify the people in the state. But if we don't any, we don't have, if we don't have any power to control or to manage this organization, especially those who are against the ideology of Pancasila, maybe we will have some kind of, let's say, future drug of our Indonesia. Because as mentioned by Pak Muti before, an organization like Hati Ai, for instance, Hizbut Tahrir. Hizbut Tahrir is an organi international organization, but we have here Hizbut Tahrir Indonesia. The center of Hizbut is in London, in in the UK. But we have very active uh, brands uh, in here. And because of this uh, new law, proposed new law, new law proposed by the president of uh, Jokowi, the government, uh, this, uh, how to say, mencabut izin, uh, yeah, revokes uh, the state permission. This is our reality, and I think even in the social media, in the social media, if we see the social media in Indonesia, every day is a lot of bullying, a lot of uh, confronting ideas and those who are involved in this confrontation and the battlefield of tweet lands sometimes they go to the police and report file the report because they feel they are bullied if it is individual matters maybe it is part of uh, uh, the life of uh, democracy but if it is related to the religion, now people are very easy to report the, the other because of the reason of uh, blasphemy. No. And almost every day there is one people come to uh, coming to the uh, national police to report someone who feel uh, according to them they already do the blasphemy to Islam or to Christianity, to Buddhism, mostly to Islam. Yeah. And in democratic in, in democratic uh, way of democracy Pancasila, we can handle this. But in liberal democracy, we should give them a chance to contest. Thank you. Thank you. Well, I think uh, what we what we got from the you know, the three speakers is that democracy is still alive. Uh, it's not perfect, and there are people who are trying to abuse. And the solution, as my partner, uh, Mas said, is for the people to actually participate more, make sure that they elect the right leaders and the right representatives in the elections. That's how changes are made. It's in the same way that those who are anti-democracy, they abuse or they take advantage of the, of the system. Uh, the blasphemy law is still with us. They use that quite effectively and they, they use the social media. Social media is open to everyone, it's a public space. And part of the battle, political battle, even the battle for the soul, is now conducted to the, to the internet. And, uh, you know, the, the best person wins, I guess. Eh? Uh, so, you know, if the, uh, the, the bad guys are winning it, if that's because the good guys are not as sophisticated uh, as the, the other side. And I think we can all turn to the, this university for help in winning the battle in social media. <laughs> okay, on that note, I'd like to open this uh, the, 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 the session to, to the floor. Please raise your hands. I'm going to start with on this side first, and then to the side. So I have one, two, three, hands raised. Uh, who's, who's going to move? Uh, Thank you.
you, Masandi, for the opportunity. Uh, my name is Diofio Alfa. I'm from Frederick Naval Foundation. Uh, I have questions for uh, Mrs. Uh, Yeni Wahid. Uh, uh, reflecting from the previous uh, gover gover gubernatorial uh, elections uh, in Jakarta, um, we could say that the uh, extremists are gaining ground and they are disrupting the democratic process uh, in that election. Uh, and we still have uh, many elections in the upcoming years. In 2018, we'll have uh, uh, regional elections, and uh, in 2019, we'll have uh, presidential elections. What do you think is the best uh, approach to uh, countering the narrative of the extremist group in Indonesia? And second of all is, uh, related to this conference, uh, I've read many reports from the White Institute regarding to the uh, abuses of the minority groups in Indonesia, and um, I'm, I'm wondering whether uh, there is there will there be any uh, survey or research on how the media plays role in further marginalizing the minority groups in Indonesia. Yep, thank you. Uh, thank you, Pandi, for the invitation and opportunity. Uh, I'm Mila from the Habibi Center, and I would like to ask two questions to all panelists, if I may, uh, following Pandi's question to Pa Shafiq. Uh, is there a current rising populism in Indonesia? Uh, is a serious challenge for democracy itself, or it's only the art of democracy itself? Because uh, yeah, we are really tired with the current situations. And my second question is, uh, we cannot neglect the fact that Islam has so many faces. Islam as religious identity, Islam as political identity, cultural ident identity, and so on and so forth. And do we need to separate the identity of Islam as religious identity and as political identity to prevent uh, f uh, future use of re religious Islam as religious Id identity to achieve political identity? If so, how could it uh, how could it be? And if we cannot, if if it's impossible to separate the uh, uh, religious identity and the political identity, how can we make those uh, so many faces of Islam go hand in hand together? Thank can, you. Can you repeat the first question? Yeah. Oh yeah. Uh, do you think the current rising populism in Indonesia is a serious challenge, or it's only the art of democracy itself? Thank you. There was a third hand in the back there. Oh, yes. Thank you. My name is Tantana Subagio. I'm from the uh, Sama Institute of Linguistics International. Uh, which I sense right now, I felt that there is increasingly education or let's say a wrong education uh, and then the face of Islam is uh, converted or trans uh, or changed from cool Islam in my youth for instance toward a more fiery Islam and then also the education is not helping them we see that uh, one of the uh, one of the uh, biggest university in one, one country, it uh, become a, a place where STI is there, and then the buy-up of the, the students and everything. Uh, my question is that how we can cope with that? How we can we can turn back the, the face of Islam to be cooler or cool Islam, like when I was uh, when I was young or when I was little. It's a very, very uh, cool Islam, and then we are we live together. Thank you very much. I okay. think uh, first question was addressed to Mayen. Uh, counter narratives of the extremist groups and whether the White Institute is going to come out with a report about more specifically on the role of media. Um. The best approach in countering extremist narratives is not allowing them 
to control the space, which means that you have to fight back, which means that you have to put out your own narratives of peace and tolerance. There was some wisdom in the past that says that if you are being bullied by the extremist groups, for example, social media and Twitter or whatever, just ignore them. People said that if you if you fight back, then it, it gives them more uh, more platform. It gives them more recognition of their message. But now, the common wisdom is that you cannot just stay silent. You have to fight back. You have to push them back. They are trying to push the boundaries, and you have to defend your own boundaries. So, um, and they are going to do that aggressively. So, moderate Muslims have to fight back as aggressive as the radical Muslims. A good friend of mine, his name is uh, Abdurrahman Malik. He's a, uh, he's a British Muslim activist. Uh, he's got a, a, a foundation it's called Radical Middle Way. Very cool name. And he's a very cool dude as well. But he came up with this um, term. There is a... Um, uh, there's a... Um, imbalance of passions. Imbalance of passions between people. Between the radicals and the, uh, and the moderates. You see, the moderates... We wake up in the morning, we pray, we take showers, we um, get ready for work or get ready for school, and have breakfast, that's, uh, you know, and so on, etc. The radicals, they wake up in the morning and they think, how am I going to do my jihad today? You know, there is that disproportionate uh, level of passion between the two groups. So we, the moderates, we need to show the same kind of passion in fighting back the radicals' rhetoric, the extremist rhetoric. We cannot just stay silent. Um, and now also, the jihadists, the, um, the extremists, they have found a new way in carrying out the jihad. It's not just about uh, you know, carrying out attacks using bombs or uh, etc., or a real attacks, physical attacks, but it's also retweeting messages of ISIS, for example. ISIS put out thousands of messages, right? Um, and gets amplified, retweeted by their followers every single day. So how do we go about it? Then we need to do the same thing. We as moderates, we need to get our narratives out there. I don't believe that the kind of uh, values that ISIS espouses is a true reflection of Islamic values. In fact, it's against the Islamic principles. And I need to get this message out to make sure that uh, there are Muslims out there who are probably just new converts or who doesn't un really understand uh, the true message of Islam, that they don't get easily persuaded by, by the uh, persuasions of the radicals. Uh, and the second question is how, how media, has there been any research? We haven't done any research yet, but we are more than open to collaborate with, uh, maybe with Saju, to see whether the media actually plays a role in, in marginalizing minority groups in this country. So, but one thing is for sure that the media can play a role in helping the minority groups by uh, making sure that people hear about their sufferings. All right, the next question about populism, is this something that we should be worried about? Can I ask, ask Muki to answer that? Yeah, there are populism and there are also narcissism. There is a book entitled Epidemic Narcissism. And this actually going together inextricably with populism and also political propaganda. <laughs> people who are very popular and entertain himself or themselves through many media, they usually very popular and got elected in the election. That is why we also, when, when we see this as part of the reality of our democracy, then we see artists who are popular, then they are likely to be elected in the election. People doesn't care, people do not care about the quality, 
they just care about the popularity. So when the when the major is a singer, then they will develop the sing culture, <laughs> or maybe singing society, <laughs> and so on and so forth. This is the reality that is not always easy to cope with. But then media can actually also help them. And since this strategy is successful, then we can see people who never actually meet the people.